Hello, I am AARP Vice President Bill Walsh. I'd like to welcome you to another AARP conversation with national health experts and leaders who will answer your questions about protecting your health and well-being. Before we begin, if you'd like to hear this telephone town hall in Spanish, press star zero on your telephone keypad now. Si usted desea escuchar en español, presione asterisco y cero en su teléfono ahora. AARP is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization that has been working to promote the health and well being of older Americans for more than 60 years. Together, we're moving beyond the pandemic. But as the recent spike in cases has shown, COVID continues to be an unwelcome guest in many of our lives. It seems it will have a presence for the foreseeable future. In our conversation today, we'll learn more about the new COVID variants and vaccines that have just been approved to treat them. We'll get expert insight on other vaccines such as flu and RSV. And we'll hear about how important changes in Medicare could impact you and your loved ones. Headlining our panel of experts today is Javier Becerra, Secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. We'll also get an update from Capitol Hill on issues affecting older adults. If you've participated in one of our teletown halls in the past, you know this is similar to a radio talk show, and you have the opportunity to ask your questions live. For those of you joining us on the phone, if you'd like to ask a question, press star three on your telephone to be connected with an AARP staff member who will note your name and question and place you in the queue to ask that question live. If you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you can post your question in the comments. Hello, if you're just joining, I'm Bill Walsh with AARP, and I wanna welcome you to this important discussion about key information you need to know about Medicare, COVID variants, and vaccines. We're talking with leading experts today and taking your questions live. This event is being recorded, and you can access the recording at aarp.org forward slash health discussion, just 24 hours after we wrap up. Again, to ask your question, please press star three at any time on your telephone keypad, and you'll be connected with an AARP staff member, or if you're joining on Facebook or YouTube, go ahead and drop your question into the comment section. Now I'd like to welcome our guests. The Honorable Javier Becerra is the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the first Latino to hold that office in the history of the United States. In that role, he works to ensure that all Americans have health security and access to health care. Welcome, Secretary Becerra. Bill, thank you for having me. Thanks to all the folks at AARP for what you've done. We're here talking about these things because of the work done by you and your members, and I'm thrilled to be here with uh, a panel of experts. All right. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedule. I'd also like to welcome Anand Parekh, MD, Chief Medical Advisor at the Bipartisan Policy Center, where he provides clinical and public health expertise across the organization. Dr. Parekh was also recognized by the Washingtonian as one of Washington, D.C.'s 500 most influential people. Welcome, Dr. Parekh. Thank you so much, Bill. It's great to be with you. Great to be with the Secretary, and thank you to AARP for everything you do. All right. We're delighted to have you. And Lee Purvis is the Prescription Drug Policy Principal here at AARP. Lee is a recognized expert on prescription drug pricing and coverage. She leads a team of policy advisors who work on health care issues that are relevant to Americans 50 and older. Welcome, Lee. Thanks, Bill, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. All right. Dr. Parekh and Lee Purvis will join the program shortly. We want to start with Secretary Becerra. And just a reminder to our listeners to ask your question. Please press star three on your telephone keypad or drop it into the comment section on Facebook or YouTube. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your time today. Um, it's been a year since historic legislation passed, the Inflation Reduction Act. How is it helping Medicare beneficiaries save money? Well, Bill, we're beginning to see the uh, results already uh, starting in January of this year. A lot of Americans uh, on, on Medicare realized that they were no longer going to have to pay more than $35 a month for the insulin that keeps them alive. 
Uh, I can tell you any number of stories of people that I've met, and I've gone throughout the country talking about this. I had one woman in Texas who said to me, I felt embarrassed uh, in January. I went in to collect my uh, insulin. I, I was accustomed to paying 117 I think she said it was $117 uh, for that month's supply. She said, I noticed in my bill after I left the pharmacist, it was 35 bucks. I went back because I felt guilty, and I said, you, you undercharged me. And he said, no, that's the price now. Uh, it's $35. And she was ecstatic. This is a woman who lives on a fixed income with her Social Security. And to know that she's no longer having to pay $117 a month was just something that took her over the moon. And that's what I've been hearing a lot. Although I will tell you, Bill, it's not just insulin. It's the fact that now shingles, shingles is the uh, vaccine I hear most about from Americans because so many Americans on Medicare actually skip their shingles vaccine because it's too expensive, two, three, four hundred dollars for shingles. Now, zero cost as a result of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the president's lower cost prescription drug law. And so whether it's insulin at thirty five dollars, whether it's shingles, the flu vaccine, the various vaccines that are prescribed by physicians for Medicare uh, uh, beneficiaries that are now zero out of pocket cost. Those are all the benefits of the Inflation Reduction Act. But the big one, which you heard the announcement about, that we're going to start negotiating with drug companies on what they charge Americans for their drugs. Because as we know, in America, we pay probably two, three times more than other folks have to around the world for the exact same drug. So we're looking forward to that. Probably have some questions about those 10 drugs, so let me stop there. All right. I, I indeed uh, do have questions about the ability of Medicare for the first time, really, to be able to negotiate drug prices directly with the pharmaceutical manufacturers. What are those changes going to mean for consumers? Well, hopefully it means a lot less out of their pocket to pay for drugs, and hopefully it also means that Americans generally will get to benefit from having prices that reflect what the costs are and what others are paying. We no longer do we have to think about going to Canada or to Mexico to buy those prescription medications so that we can afford to pay our rent the next month. Uh, those are the kinds of things that bring peace of mind. And what is health care, or at least good health care and wellness, but peace of mind? That's what we're hoping comes, and we're already beginning to, to see the fruits of it, and there's still more to come. Now, how did CMS identify which drugs to negotiate? Is it solely a matter of cost, or were there other criteria used for the initial 10 drugs that were selected? And, and Bill, I want to tell you it was easy. Nothing is easy when it comes to dealing with <laughs> uh, prescription medication. But I will tell you that uh, Congress gave us a really clear roadmap on how to go about doing the drug price negotiations. So we essentially followed the instructions provided by Congress. We took some 7,400 drugs that right now receive some level of coverage under Medicare Part D, and then we take, took a look at the criteria that Congress set forth for us in the ter determining which would be the first 10 drugs that would be negotiated. The result was 10 drugs that when you take them together, just those 10 of the 7,400 drugs, they represent about 20% of all the spending that you and I and the Medicare program does under Medicare Part D for those d drugs, about 20% mm. of the entire cost. That means that uh, we are going to be able to help some 8 million people who are on Medicare who use those among those 10 drugs. Uh, and that's about, well, 16, 17% of the entire Medicare population that takes one of those 10 drugs. And so once we get into negotiations, we hope we could come up with a price that's fair and one that will reflect what really people should be playing, paying. And the result, I hope, will be that for the first time in our history, we're going to be able to do what most Americans think we already should be able to do. And that is negotiate to get the best price for whatever we pay. You mentioned that these were really uh, high price drugs and quite common drugs among people who are on Medicare. Let me just uh, go over the list very quickly for our listeners who may not have seen the release two weeks ago. Um, uh, those 10 drugs were Eliquis and Xarelto. Those are two blood thinners. Uh, Genuvia and Jardiance, uh, diabetes drugs. Enbrel, Imbruvica, Farsiga and Tresto, Stellara. And FIASP and Novolog, those are for diabetes. I wonder, Mr. Secretary, are there opportunities for the public to weigh in on this list or future drugs that will be subject to negotiation? 
Oh, yes. Uh, we take public comment uh, in the process of coming up with the 10 drugs. We tried to be as transparent as we could be. So not just uh, the drug companies, but the American people could understand how we came to this list of 10 drugs. Uh, we're going to do everything we can to try to be as transparent as the law allows when it comes to the actual negotiations, because we want people to recognize what it takes to get to a good price. Uh, again, seven of the 10 drugs deal with some of the worst chronic conditions that we see, like diabetes, stroke, cardiovascular disease. Three of the 10 drugs, uh, while they have a smaller patient population, they're very important because they go to treat things like cancer and autoimmune diseases. Very good. Mr. Secretary, let's pivot to uh, COVID vaccines for a moment because there's been some news around this quite recently. Earlier this week, the FDA, of course, approved new COVID vaccines. Um, how do these vaccines differ from those that have been on the market for some time? And when will they be available to people? And, and finally, who should consider um, an updated COVID vaccine? Well, first, you should be able to make an appointment right now for that new vaccine, the, the uh, updated vaccine. It is a vaccine that, unlike previous vaccines, is meant to target the COVID variant that's hitting hardest now. And so that's why it's important to get updated because you may have been vaccinated several months ago. You may have been vaccinated with one of the previous vaccines. All of that is good because it provides you a level of protection. But if you want to maintain the highest level of that protection, you want to get this updated vaccine. So everyone who hasn't received a vaccine in the last couple of months should consider coming in as quickly as possible. If you had the uh, infection recently, uh, you know, you, while you ha may have some natural immunity, it always helps within the last two, three months to come in and get that updated vaccine as well. And what you're going to find is that you're going to be protected against the, the severest uh, uh, forms of COVID, uh, perhaps help you pretty substantially avoiding hospital stays, and certainly, as the uh, evidence has proven, keep you alive. And so for all those reasons, we hope that people will get vaccinated with this updated vaccine and quite honestly, treat it the way you treat the flu vaccine. Every year, our scientists manufacture a vaccine for flu that is meant to address the variant of the flu that we think is gonna be most uh, uh, heavy and impactful for this flu season. And that's what we're doing now with COVID. So we hope everyone will get, get vaccinated. By the way, tests are still available. And also, if you do get sick, treatments are available. So get vaccinated, get tested, get treated. All of that you can do without having to pay for it, uh, uh, a single penny. Oh, well, let me pick up on that. Will there be new programs available, including in the states, to help people obtain that um, COVID-19 vaccine um, if people are uninsured? Well, President Biden has made it very clear from the beginning. No one is safe until everyone is safe, and no one should have to forego a vaccine because they don't think they can afford it. So everyone in America has been able to get a, a vaccine, COVID vaccine shot, without having to pay. That's close to 700 million vaccines that have been administered so far to the uh, some 270 million Americans who've gotten some form of a vaccine. Uh, and we want people to know that that continues today. We're doing everything under the pre president's leadership to make sure nobody has to pay. And so for those who don't have insurance, and insurance will cover the cost for most people. And so if you have Medicare, your Medicare insurance will cover your cost. But for those who don't have insurance, we established a bridge program, which gives people access to the vaccines, whether through a pharmacy nearby in your neighborhood, whether through a uh, uh, public health uh, uh, health center, a federally qualified health center in your neighborhood, or perhaps directly from a state, a local health department. All of, all three of those uh, different cohorts are uh, making available the vaccine to those who do not have insurance free of charge. All right. Excellent information. Do you want to take some questions from our listeners? Absolutely. All right. It's now time to address your questions uh, for Secretary Becerra. As a reminder, Press star three at any time on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member uh, to share your question live on the air. And if you'd like to listen in Spanish, press star zero on your telephone keypad now.
Si usted desea escuchar en español, presione asterisco y cero en su teléfono ahora. I'd now like to bring in my AARP colleague, Jesse Salinas, to help facilitate your calls today. Welcome, Jesse. So good to be here today, Bill. All right. Who do we have first on the line? Our first caller is Diane in Indiana. Hey, Diane. Welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question for the secretary. Uh, my question was just answers that I can get the shot now. I had heard you had to wait. You had to get the shot shot in six months afterward and now they say you can do it if you haven't had the shot uh two months ago so i think I've, my question's been answered mr secretary i think i heard you say you can get the shot immediately is that right yeah you should be able to schedule an appointment to go in now and uh, we urge you to do so and always by the way if you have a physician always talk to your physician to be clear on how you should go about doing this i want to make sure that uh no one is uh doing anything contrary to the advice of your physician, but your physician will likely tell you. If it's been a couple of months since you got the last vaccine, you're ready. Okay. Jesse, let's go to our next caller. Our next caller is going to be Wendy in New York. Hey, Wendy. Welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Um, I missed the very beginning because I was on the phone with, I think it's Jesse, but addressing the 10 medications that are going to be um, negotiated with Medicare, um, I'm actually on Solera and I'm turning 65. And on my commercial plan, it cost me $50 a shot. And I was shocked to find out that it's going to cost me $20,000 a year under Medicare. Now, I read this is not going into effect, the negotiations with Medicare, until 2026, um, January of 26. Is it being phased in? Are there any savings starting immediately or next mm. year? Mr. Secretary? Yeah, Wendy, great question. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I give you the best information I can, but please follow up with us if you have any further questions. Uh, what I will tell you is that the negotiation will start up now, uh, and we have for the next year an opportunity to meet and confer with the drug companies. Uh, this is all voluntary. They needn't engage in the negotiation. But if they do voluntarily agree to uh, engage in the negotiation, then we will try to make sure we uh, arrive at a price by uh, about a year from now, August of next year. That price then will be announced and then be effective in 20, January of 2026. Uh, then we'll do the same thing for a batch of another 15 drugs. That, will, that negotiation will be effective January 2027 another 15 drugs the following year, then another 20 drugs after that and going forward. That's the way to work. What happens in between, to your question, you want to make sure you're talking to your physician and your uh, those you speak to directly with regard to Medicare uh, services once you uh, are in the program to make sure you're getting the uh, direct information about how that works for you. And whether there might be some alternatives that, that – that's right. And I, I got to believe that there will yeah. be alternatives because no one wants to hit a massive uh, cliff uh, right when they're getting onto Medicare. Right. Let's take another question. Jesse? Our next caller is going to be Ruth in Georgia. Hey, Ruth. Welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question for Secretary Becerra. Okay. So um, I have four vaccines set up. And um, you did answer one question about the COVID being at zero, the COVID booster being at zero cost, and shingles being at zero cost. Um, I'm going to have the shots at the Walgreens, and so I wanted to know what about the pneumonia and flu that I'm scheduled for? Are they also uh, at zero cost? Mr. Secretary, do you have information on that? Yes. And Ruth, thank you for the question, for giving me a chance to uh, add a little bit more detail. The flu vaccine should be included as well. The way the law was written, Ruth, is to say that if you are medically prescribed that vaccine, and that means that when you've gone to your physician under Medicare, your physician says for preventative purposes, you really should have this or that particular vaccine, then that would qualify you to receive it without having to put any money out of pocket. Uh, and so what you want to make sure is that it is a, a, a vaccine that has been prescribed to you that your physicians are saying uh, are good for preventative reasons for you to get. By the way, RSV might be on that list, but I, I would urge everyone to make sure you're checking with your providers to be sure. But the flu 
COVID, shingles. Again, if those are uh, vaccines that your uh, physician is telling you you should get, then they will be covered under Medicare. All right. Let's see if we can squeeze in one more question. Jesse? Our next call is going to be Sandra from Massachusetts. Hey, Sandra, welcome to the program. Go ahead with your question. All right. My question is COVID. I've gone to emergency three times on this COVID. I do not have COVID right now, but I've been left with a big head thing, which is I couldn't lift my head from the pillow. And not only that, um, my question is this. I had COVID. I've been told that I should not have the COVID shot right off the bat because I've already had COVID. Um, the side effects to this third one seem to be more intense than the previous ones. I've had it three times, and I've had all the shots. All right. What I want to know is what kind of side effects are people having and, you know, you can't take COVID because you've had COVID. So how long should you wait to get a COVID shot? Uh, thanks so much, Sandra. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I know the CDC recommended this shot for everyone, really, over six months old. What are we hearing about side effects? And what about Sandra's question about how long should she wait? Yeah, it, w what a great question from Sandra, because my suspicion is there are a lot of folks who are uh, facing some of the same circumstances that Sandra's been going through. So first and foremost, I gotta say thank you, Sandra, for having gotten the shots. There are people who are having some side effects, but again, side effects are a lot different from dying because you didn't get uh, a vaccine. And so uh, what we've been told by the scientists and it has been proven by the actual implementation of the COVID vaccine uh, program is that uh, while there may be some side effects for some, others have no side effects, but while, while there may be some side effects, it is proven that the vaccine is keeping a lot of folks from dying or going to, to the hospital. So, to, Sandra, to your particular point, uh, first, again, always the best advice is to make sure you're speaking first to your physician. Uh, they, he, she will know best what, what circumstances you bring to the table. So make sure you're always consulting with your physician. Uh, and follow the, your physician's guidance. But the CDC and the FDA have said that this vaccine, which is available for anyone six months of age or older, uh, should be available to you if you haven't been vaccinated in the last couple of months, or if you haven't, or if you're, the last time you had COVID was a few months ago. So if, if the last infection you had was more than a few months ago, chances are you should get the vaccine but in your case, what you want to do, just to be sure, because you've had side effects, is consult with your physician just to be sure. But uh, I think most, for the most part, I think the, the important thing to point out here is that, Sandra, you're doing the right thing. And you're also doing the right thing in checking in the event of side effects. But no doubt that we should be preparing for COVID. We should be preparing for the flu. Some of us should be preparing for RSV. And so uh, I thank those of you, like Sandra, who've actually taken on the task of making sure you're protecting not just yourself but others. We want to go into the holidays being able to hug and kiss our relatives and not infect them. Okay. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you so much for your insights today. I know you have some other obligations. We are really grateful for your time and the advice that you gave our listeners today. Bill, to you, to ARP for everything you do, but most importantly to the members who really make ARP what it is. Thank you so much for being there. We're here today talking about better prices for drugs, being able to provide vaccines to everyone under Medicare because your members fought for that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Okay, and to all our listeners, thank you for all your questions. We're gonna be taking more questions shortly. And remember, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star three on your telephone keypad. Um, through conversations like this, AARP provides you with access to national decision makers and experts to answer your questions and hear about your needs. We have another great program next week when PBS's NewsHour correspondent Lisa Desjardins leads a public discussion about the future of Social Security. This bipartisan conversation will include Republican Senator Bill Cassidy from Louisiana and Democratic Congressman John Larson from Connecticut. It will also include AARP's CEO, Joanne Jenkins, and AARP Board Chairman, Lloyd Johnson. 
In the next 10 years, of course, Social Security will face financial challenges that must be solved. And Senator Cassidy and Congressman Larson will discuss their ideas to protect and save Social Security. This program will be available live online at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on September 21st at the web address aarp.org forward slash social security future. That address again is aarp.org forward slash social security future. Now, if you'd like to join the program, we'd like to make it as easy as possible for you. If you press um, the number one on your telephone keypad right now, that's the number one, we'll call you with a voicemail reminder about 30 minutes before the program begins on September 21st with all the details about how to join and how to participate. I'm really looking forward to this critical conversation. I hope you all can join us as well. Now let's turn back to our topic today, and that is Medicare, COVID, and vaccines. I'd like to welcome Lee Purvis uh, to talk to us about the changes to Medicare and what they mean for older adults. Welcome, Lee. Thank you, Bill. All right. Lee, uh, what is the timetable for prescription drug prices to be lowered in, and how do negotiators, how long do these negotiation prices remain in effect? Very important question. Yes. So, while the announcement of the first drugs that are going to be negotiated by Medicare was definitely very exciting for people like me, um, it's safe to say that we're still pretty much in the early stages of the negotiation process. So as the secretary kind of touched on, the first 10 drugs to be negotiated were announced a couple weeks ago, and the negotiation process will officially kick off in early October. That will be followed by a series of meetings and some back and forth between the drug companies and CMS during the negotiation period, and that will end on, October, on August 1st, 2024. And the first negotiated prices will be published by September 1st, 2024. As you heard, those first negotiated prices will become available in 2026, and additional negotiated prices will become every year after that. Okay, some of our listeners may be wondering, why does it take so long? Why do I have to wait till 2026 to see these price reductions? So I think the short answer is that the U.S. has never negotiated drug prices for 65 million people. HHS is really building this program from the ground up, and they've had to create and fill dozens of new positions. So it's really something that takes some time to get up and running, not to mention the time that's needed to negotiate with drug companies. I think another really important thing to keep in mind when it comes to the timeline for this is that there are a lot of other provisions in the new drug law that have already started rolling out. So, for example, you heard about no-cost vaccines. Um, we are also penalizing drug companies who increase their prices faster than inflation. And you also heard about the copay limits for insulin that are already in effect. And starting in just a few months, people in prescription drug plans won't have to pay any more money out of pocket after they reach catastrophic coverage. Um, that previous caller who mentioned a very expensive drug, you will no longer face those kinds of costs because there will no longer be any cost sharing once your out-of-pocket costs reach a certain threshold. And then we also have a lot of people who are qualifying for the extra help program that helps with premiums and cost sharing. That said, I do want to be clear, I completely empathize with people who want things to happen faster. I myself have family members with very high prescription drug costs who hit catastrophic coverage every single year. And I've told them the same thing I'm going to tell you, which is that negotiation may take a little bit of time to get going, but it is going to deliver lower drug prices for people in Medicare every single year after that. Okay. And so uh, building on that, what about other drugs? Will Medicare be adding to the list of the original 10? Yes, this is really just the start. This is a cumulative process, and new drugs are going to be added every year, which the secretary kind of talked about a little bit. Um, CMS is going to go through the same selection process and announce the second group of drugs that are going to be negotiated by early February 2025. And the negotiation prices will be published by the end of November that same year. Um, those prices will become available in 2027. And that's actually the cadence for the negotiation process every year going forward. The selected drugs will be announced by February, and the prices will be announced by the end of November. It's also important to keep in mind that the number of drugs that are going to be included in negotiation is going to increase over the next few years. Um, we're going to have a couple years where 15 drugs are selected, and then after that, 20 drugs are going to be selected every year. So that means as many as 60 drugs could be negotiated by 2029. Great news. Now, Lee, we've heard that the drug companies have already filed lawsuits to halt these negotiations. Do we know how that will affect the timing of the price reductions? 
Yeah, I think it pretty much everyone expected that drug companies were going to file lawsuits to try to stop Medicare from engaging in negotiation, and that is exactly what happened. Um, this really is how they responded to pretty much anything that is attempting to address drug prices, and this new law is no different. Um, I think overall what I'm seeing and hearing is that we are kind of facing a spaghetti at the wall situation where the drug companies have been filing multiple lawsuits around various aspects of negotiation in the hopes that they can get some legal traction. Um, we and many other legal experts believe that they have an uphill battle ahead of them. Um, AARP and AARP Foundation have filed an amicus brief urging the court to dismiss any attempts to slow Medicare negotiation. We strongly believe that Medicare is a program that's here for its beneficiaries and not to support drug company profits. Mm. And I would not be surprised to see AARP and AARP Foundation continue to engage in those court cases going forward. So while we can't say exactly how the courts are going to rule, what we can say is that AARP is going to do everything it can to ensure that Medicare negotiation is not slowed by what we believe to be groundless drug company lawsuits. Okay, thank you very much, Lee Purvis. Let's shift our gaze a little bit now to Capitol Hill. I want to take a couple of minutes and bring in Megan O'Reilly, Vice President at AARP, to talk about how AARP is fighting for older adults uh, on these issues and more. Welcome, Megan. Great to be here, Bill. All right, Megan, today we're talking about important health issues and the critical public policy role in ensuring coverage and affordability. What are some of the changes ARP is fighting for on behalf of older Americans, and what are some of the successes we're seeing? You know, in addition to hosting events like this, we're really advocating across every state and in Congress to strengthen Medicare, lower prescription drug prices, support family caregivers, and save people money. Right now, we're fighting for broader Medicare coverage of dental, hearing, and vision, as well as increased access to telehealth and mental health services. As far as successes, our fight for family caregivers recently led to an executive order and follow-up regulatory action to provide caregivers with new uh, relief and long overdue. And this year, we're seeing the implementation of big changes that we've been talking about today from our historic win to help lower Medicare prescription drug prices. Yes, and as we've been talking about, two weeks ago, the federal government announced the first set of 10 prescription drugs that Medicare will start negotiating for lower prices. Uh, what can you tell us about this? AARP has fought for decades to lower prescription drug prices, and it's great that the for the first time in history, the price of some life-sustaining medications that millions of people rely on to prevent stroke and blood clots and to treat diabetes and cancer will be subject to the direct negotiation from Medicare that we've been talking about today. Big drug companies pad their profits by setting outrageous prices, all at the expense of American lives. We know the number one reason seniors skip or ration their prescriptions is because they simply can't afford them. Allowing Medicare to negotiate prices for these first 10 drugs with more drugs to follow in coming years is a common sense solution that will save seniors money and cut government spending. Now, as we heard from Lee, the big drug companies are trying to stop this negotiation, and we are fighting to protect these cost savings and to allow for even more in the future. What are some of the other Medicare changes that our listeners should know about? Already in effect this year, the new law caps the cost of Medicare-covered insulin at $35 a month and eliminates out-of-pocket costs for most recommended vaccines such as the new COVID booster and the shingles vaccine. There will also be a new annual out-of-pocket cap of $2,000 uh, as part of the Medicare drug plans, which starts in 2025. And this is going to put money back into seniors' pockets, which we know is so critically important. Okay. Now, in some other news, um, this month, uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued a proposed rule to establish a minimum federal staffing standard for nursing homes who are participating in Medicare and or Medicaid. Why is this so important? We saw that COVID reveal what AARP and other advocates have been saying for decades. The lack of standards in too many of America's nursing homes is a matter of life and death. Too many Americans have unnecessarily died in nursing homes plagued by poor quality care. This new proposal is an important step to establish a minimum nursing home staffing standard, including requiring nursing homes to have a registered nurse on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
AARP will continue to fight to ensure that every person living in a nursing home can live in dignity and get the care that they deserve. If listeners want to stay on top of ARP's advocacy news, how can they find out the latest updates? We'd encourage everyone to go online to aarp.org backslash get involved and sign up for the AARP Advocate. This is a free monthly e-newsletter, and you'll also receive email alerts and the latest advocacy news. Again, that's aarp.org backslash get involved. It's an easy way to make a big difference. All right, Megan, thank you so much for that update. And remember, to our listeners, if you'd like to ask a question of our health experts, please press star 3 on your telephone keypad or drop it into the comments section on Facebook or YouTube. We are going to get to those questions shortly. Uh, Now I'd uh, I'd like to welcome to the program Dr. Anand Parekh uh, to this conversation. Um, Thanks for your time today, Dr. Parekh. Bill, it's great to be with you. Okay. Doctor, older adults are encouraged to consider three vaccines this fall. That's that's a lot to unpack. Let's start with the most venerable, an annual influenza vaccine. How necessary is a flu vaccine? Um, when's it going to be available? And what's the risk of skipping it? You know, that's a great question, Bill. You know, flu is one of these things that we just take for granted every year. I think there are a lot of people who hear about the flu and they just say, oh, well, that's no big deal. The the reality is, unfortunately, tens of thousands of Americans die from the flu. Every year, hundreds of thousands of Americans are hospitalized from the flu. And the brunt of this falls on the elderly population. So 70 to 85 percent of deaths are in the older population. 50 to 70 percent of hospitalizations are in in the older population. And so why this vaccine is so important is it it reduces the risk of having to see a doctor for flu. It reduces the risk of hospitalizations, of ICU admissions, as well as death. And that's really why the recommendation is for all Americans over the age of six months, certainly older adults are at highest risk, to really go out and get the flu vaccine, which is available now. I will also say, Bill, an important point to remember, the flu vaccine won't give you the flu. And I think that's a common misconception or myth out there Some people may get some side effects, a sore arm, might get some muscle aches, fatigue. That'll go away in a few days typically, but the flu vaccine won't give you the flu. It's really safe and effective. Okay, very good. When's the right time to get the flu vaccine this fall? And what's different about the high-dose flu vaccine we've heard so much about? Yeah, that's a great question. There are actually a a number of different flu vaccines uh, out there. And the high-dose flu vaccine, what that's all about is it's a particular vaccine that has four times the amount of antigen or the substance of the protein that's important to stimulate an immune response in your body. Uh, For some people, that causes slightly increased side effects, but it increases the chance of preventing the flu. Uh, There are actually three different vaccines when you go to the pharmacy or your doctor's office. If you're over 65, you might get the high-dose vaccine. You might get a an adjuvanted vaccine or a recombinant vaccine, any of those three are perfectly fine. All of them have been found uh, for the elderly population uh, to stimulate more of an immune response than a standard dose. So uh, I think any of those three would be perfectly fine. In terms of when to get the vaccine, I would say, Bill, any time in the next four to six weeks. You can get it now. There is an argument uh, that some would make uh, to wait till October um, Flu usually peaks between December and February, so if you wait till October, maybe that'll get you through the season. Others would argue, get it now. Um, The Northern Hemisphere follows the Southern Hemisphere, and their season, their flu season, was slightly earlier. But I think at the end of the day, whatever is convenient for you, if it's September, if it's October, but certainly get it now. I will also say, Bill, that if you want, and if it's convenient for you, you can get the flu shot with the COVID shot. Many people did that last year, and it was convenient perfectly fine and safe to do so uh, as well, if you wish. Okay, thank you very much. Now, there's also a new vaccine for RSV, which can infect the lungs and respiratory tract of older adults and children. Um, The RSV vaccine is brand new. Um, Why is it needed? You know, RSV is really a virus uh, that, that, that most people get, and they experience a common cold. 
However, for older adults and children, uh, they can actually get respiratory distress um, and pneumonia. And so now we actually have some tools for children, um, uh, uh, antibodies or medicines for infants, pregnant women, there's a vaccine. And also for older adults over the age of 60, there is a new vaccine now, a very effective vaccine. Actually, if you take it once, it could protect you for multiple seasons. Uh, there have been some rare cases of, of what's called Guillain-Barre syndrome, where your, your immune system attacks nerves. And so the recommendation is for this one, before you uh, take it, talk to your healthcare professional, make sure it's right for you. I think it's going to be particularly important for individuals with lung disease, heart disease, diabetes, individuals who are immunocompromised. They are going to be good candidates. But this is another vaccine. It's available now. Uh, and it's a, another one that we shouldn't take for granted. In fact, RSV in the older population um, leads to thousands of deaths each year. Uh, so another one that we should be conscious about. Okay, very good. Thank you for that, Dr. Parekh. Now it's time to address more of your questions with Dr. Anand Parekh and Lee Purvis. As a reminder, press star 3 at any time on your telephone keypad to be connected with an AARP staff member and get into the queue to ask your question live. Jesse, who do we have on the line? Yeah, I'm going to start with Carol in Indiana. Hey, Carol, welcome to the program. Go ahead with your question. My doctor wants me to get the advanced shingles vaccine because I do have Part D of the Medicare insurance. Uh, how do I prove? I don't get a card with that. So how do I prove when I go to the pharmacy that I have Part D to get that more advanced shingles vaccination? Mm, Dr. Perret, can you help with that? Yeah, most pharmacists should know uh, now that that shingles is covered by Medicare Part D and, and there should not be any more cost sharing as the secretary uh, alluded to. So, uh, of course, if there are any concerns, then, then certainly contacting uh, Medicare, but hopefully the pharmacy should be able to figure that out. Okay, and Lee, can you add anything to that? Yeah, I think uh, one alternative, if you're unable to uh, have that kind of productive conversation with your pharmacist, you can also contact your plan after you receive the shot and be reimbursed for the cost associated with it. Okay, good to know. All right, Jesse, let's take another call. Yeah, we're getting a lot of questions on YouTube and Facebook, Bill, about the COVID test, whether they'll remain free, whether COVID covers them, and finally, whether older tests that you still have, whether they're still good. Uh, okay. Um, Dr. Parekh, why don't we start with you? What about the cost of those uh, COVID tests? Are they free? And, and what's the advice about using an older COVID test you might have bought months or maybe even a year or two ago? Yeah, no, these are very good questions. Unfortunately, Medicare will, will no longer send beneficiaries uh, free tests. Um, however, if you do go um, into your, your physician's office, your healthcare professional's office, and you're getting tested there, um, then you will not be, uh, you will not have any kind of copayment or cost sharing. That should be free. Um, you're, you're also, obviously, you could go to a pharmacy and, and purchase tests as well. Um, but uh, to get them free, you really need to go into a healthcare setting. In terms of the, the home tests and whether the ex ex you should follow the expiration date, uh, in fact, here I think the recommendation and advice would be to, to actually go to the FDA website because many of these tests that have an expiration date, the FDA has actually um, increased the length of time that they're actually good for. So just because it's expired on the package may not mean that it's actually uh, expired, Bill. Okay, very good to know. Jesse, let's take another caller. Let's start with Greta in Kentucky. Hey, Greta, welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question. My question is, do we take? Do we need to take the flu shot first or the COVID shot first? And if you do take them at two separate times, how much time should you wait in between both of those vaccines? Hmm. Okay, thanks, Greta. Dr. Parekh? Yeah, there's no set order, so if you want to take COVID first, if you, uh, that's fine. If you want to take the flu shot first, if you want to get them together, um, that's fine. Um, and there really aren't any, any recommendations. If you do get them separately, if you, want to get, if you take one and, and you have side effects for a couple days, you might want to just wait uh, until you get uh, the, the next shot. So, um, uh, you know, whatever feels most comfortable for you, but certainly also talk to your health care provider and, and get their uh, specific guidance. 
Well, what about RSV, doctor? You talked about the importance of getting uh, a shot for that as well. Would you advise people to get three vaccines at once, or is that too many? Yeah, there's a little less research on, on RSV and co-administration with flu and, and COVID. And so I think what we can definitely recommend to everybody on the call is if you want to get COVID and flu together, certainly you can do so. But RSV, you probably want to talk to, to your physician, your healthcare provider. That That's one you might want to get at a separate time than COVID or flu, just because we don't have as much research yet on co-administration Got of it. RSV with other vaccines. Got it. Okay. Jesse, let's go back to the phones. Yeah, let's go with Denise in California. Hey, Denise, welcome to the program. Go ahead with your question. Bill, I think we lost her. Oh, okay. Conspiracy. Sorry. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, new COVID vaccines. I've been told, perhaps erroneously, that the vaccine starts to lose its effectiveness after a couple months. Does that mean that if a person gets a shot now, they would need a booster, say, in February? And if so, would a booster be available? Mm. Great question. Dr. Parekh, can you shed any light on the uh, how long these um, vaccines last, their effectiveness? Sure, sure. So in general, the, the, the main purpose of these vaccines are to prevent se- severe illness and death. Um, and so in terms of preventing symptomatic infection, you'll likely have a few month protection uh, in terms of preventing hospitalizations a little bit longer. But certainly for severe illness and death, um, you can expect to be protected uh, throughout the season. Now, what um, the FDA and, um, and CDC recommended is that for individuals over the age of 65 or those who are immunocompromised, you can get a second dose after four months. So let's say uh, you go out tomorrow and you get your COVID uh, vaccine, you would be eligible again in January to get a second dose. But again, talk to your healthcare provider whether that's, that's necessary. Okay, very good. Thank you, Dr. Parekh and Lee Purvis. Um, and thank you for all your questions. We're going to take some more questions shortly. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star three on your telephone keypad. Um, And as a reminder, if you value these AARP conversations, be be sure to join our program on September 21st on the future of Social Security. This bipartisan conversation will include Republican Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, Democratic Congressman John Larson of Connecticut, AARP CEO Joanne Jenkins, and the AARP Board Chairman Lloyd Johnson. This is a live discussion at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on September 21st, and it's available online at aarp.org slash social security future. That address again is aarp.org slash social security future. Now to help make joining that program easier for you, If you press the number one on your telephone keypad right now, that's the number one, we'll call you with a voicemail reminder about 30 minutes before the program begins on September 21st with all of the key details to join. Now let's turn back to Dr. Anand Parekh. Uh, Doctor, there are at least 36 mutations of the COVID BA286 variant. Uh, many of which help uh, it elude immune defenses. How notable is this new variant? How much protection uh, do the old COVID vaccines offer? You know, Bill, we're seeing this uh, new subvariant in a few countries. It hasn't really taken off, so there, uh, but there's still a lot of um, uh, research going on to, to try to ascertain whether this variant somehow will escape our immune defenses, whether it'll be more transmissible whether it will be more severe. The, the research to date suggests not, actually, that the old vaccines offer some protection. And this new vaccine against the XBB 1.5 variant that, that has come out this week, that that new vaccine also produces antibodies that are effective against this BA286 uh, variant. So, uh, so the best evidence that we have right now is that, in fact, that these new vaccines will protect against severe illness and, and death from BA to it to a um, 286 and our tests and our treatments work as well so vigilance is key and I think we need to continue to do uh, good surveillance but but no need for alarm uh, at this moment 
Okay, last month the CDC increased its forecast for September hospitalizations. Um, do some people remain more at risk for severe outcomes, and, and why would that be? Yeah, they do, you know, particularly older adults, those who are immunocompromised. And, and really the bill, the bill, the reason is because of the inability to mount really an optimal immune uh, response. And so vaccination is just so important, particularly for these groups, because it reduces the chance of severe illness, reduces the chance of death, reduces the chance of long COVID. And what I'm concerned about is that while older adults um, back in 2021 um, did a great job receiving their primary vaccination series, over 90% of, of seniors, when it comes to last year's booster, uh, the rate of, of uh, acceptance was, was 43%. So what that means is there are millions and millions of older adults today, in fact, perhaps the majority, who haven't gotten a COVID vaccine in, in maybe a year, maybe two years. And so that's why it's, it's that much more important for this high-risk group uh, to, to get this new vaccine so they're optimally uh, pro um, protected so we can reduce the chance of hospitalizations. And I will finally say also, Bill, that vaccination is important, but also if you have symptoms and you're at high risk, again, really important to, to test and to treat. So there are treatments that, like Paxlovid, which will also reduce your chance of hospitalization. Mm -hmm. COVID. Well, let me follow up on the vaccination rate that you mentioned. Of course, uh, the CDC has urged all people over the age of six months to get the new um, vaccine. Uh, yet just yesterday, the Surgeon General in Florida uh, warned people under the age of 65 not to get it. Um, this can, can stir some um, confusion among consumers. Um, can you help uh, sort that out? Sure. So uh, sign, uh, multiple scientific agencies now and, and here, um, here in the United States and um, um, scientific experts, researchers have, have looked at this and, and they are looking at this vaccine that is coming out this week and, and coming to the conclusion that the benefits outweigh the risks. And, and that is so for all Americans over the age of six months. I think there's also uh, a consensus that, that individuals who are older, individuals whose immune system may be compromised, that, that it's probably most important, as well as caregivers and individuals who are around the elderly or those who are immunocompromised, perhaps even uh, very, very important for these populations to get the vaccine. So the recommendation, again, is that all Americans over the age of six months should get it. Uh, but in terms of, of impact, it's probably most important, again, for these high-risk groups as well as individuals who are around these high-risk groups so we can protect them from, from um, severe illness and death. Okay. And finally, one question we've heard a lot um, is if you've gotten the initial COVID vaccine, but you haven't followed through with the additional boosters, um, do you have to backtrack to get the newest booster? How does that work? Yeah, now this is an easy one. No, you don't have to backtrack. And in fact, those older vaccines aren't even authorized anymore. You won't even be able to get them. So this one's easy. All you have to do is just get the new vaccine. Okay, very good. Now it's time to address more of your questions with Dr. Anand Parekh and Lee Purvis. As a reminder, press star three at any time on your telephone keypad to be connected with an ARP staff member and ask your question live. Jesse, who do we have next on the line? I think we got back Denise in California. Let's try to bring her on. All right, Denise, welcome to the program. Go ahead with your question. Hi. I, in the previous vaccines, they always talked about Moderna versus Pfizer. You don't hear anything much about the two. Are they the same? Are mm -hmm. there still some people who should take one or the other? Or if you had one previously, should you stick with that one? I haven't really heard much at all about Moderna or Pfizer, and I assume they're the ones that are still making it. Yeah, Denise, thanks for that question. Dr. Parekh, um, we, we hear this question a lot. Can you help sort this out? Sure. No, the, the, the caller is exactly right. Those are the two companies whose vaccines were approved by the FDA this week. So there's a Moderna um, new COVID vaccine, and there's a Pfizer new COVID vaccine. They're both mRNA vaccines, and certainly you can get either one. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you've had one previously and you don't have to stick with it so whichever one is offered um, uh, is one that you should take okay jesse who do we have up next 
Yep, our next caller is going to be Joyce in Arizona. Hey, Joyce, welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question. Hi. Um, <clears throat> my son does not have any form because of unemployment for a couple of years now. How would he get both the COVID shot and the flu shot? What would the route be for him to take those two shots? Okay. Uh, Dr. Parekh, I wonder if you can um, help out Joyce with this question. And, and Bill, did the caller say that um, uh, that the the son had no health insurance? I just want to. I believe she I did. Yes. It. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think as the secretary said, for, for COVID um, in in particular, um, uh, there is going to be a bridge access program um, through pharmacies for individuals who are uninsured. Um, and certainly for flu vaccines as well, there are places like community health centers and health departments where you can get these vaccines uh, for, for free. Uh, and so certainly going on vaccines.gov, I think that's a very good website that, that listeners should, should keep handy. That's a place where you can go you can, to find out not only where to get some of these shots, uh, but also places where uh, the vaccines may be free as well. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Parekh. Jesse, who do we have up next? Yeah, we've got a, one from social media, a Liz, who asks, I learned that the latest COVID vaccine didn't have human trials before coming to market. Is this true? Hmm. Dr. Parekh, what can you tell us about the research that went into the latest vaccines? Yeah, well, all of these vaccines, um, it, you know, we, we've now administered, as the secretary said, nearly 700 million COVID vaccines. So uh, in terms of the COVID vaccine, it is the exact same scenario in which we have annual flu vaccine. So every single year, we don't do new clinical trials uh, of, of flu vaccines. What we do is we see what are the circulating strains out there in the world and how do we make a vaccine that covers those strains that's what we do for flu, and that's exactly what is being done for, um, for COVID. So everything else is the same. The research is the same. The, the, the safety, all of that is the same. The only thing that is changing is the particular strains that are being targeted. Okay, and I just wanted to repeat that website that Dr. Parekh had given to Joyce. That is vaccines.gov. It has a lot of information about the new vaccines, uh, who is eligible, how to make an appointment, et cetera. So go ahead and check it out if you have questions. Jesse, let's take another question. Our next caller is going to be Archie in Michigan. Hi there. Welcome to our program. Go ahead with uh, your question. Well, uh, I recently uh, have uh, contacted COVID. I found out uh, Monday that I actually had the virus, I really contacted with someone with Xerity. Uh He came over to get a test uh, because he had been around someone. So right now what I'm feeling like uh, the first time I had a flu, uh, achy uh, and the nose are running a little bit, uh, I am on a uh, three-day morning and a three-day evening uh, type uh, medicine. So uh, what I'm feeling, I, I didn't even know I could get another shot. I thought I was protected. Mm. So Artie, do you, are, you, are you asking if you should uh, wait to get uh, another vaccine? I think that was well, question. All right. Dr. Parekh, maybe you can, we lost already, but maybe you can answer that question. If people are experiencing um, COVID symptoms, he said he had flu-like symptoms, what should they do in terms of waiting to get a uh, COVID vaccine? Yeah, sure. And I hope the caller is feeling better. Um, and so the recommendation is, is, is after having COVID, you can wait up to three months or so before you get a vaccine. That being said, um, uh, it's also fine once you feel better to go ahead and get the vaccine. So, so there's no real hard and fast rule, but many people do wait some time because you will be protected um, for a few months uh, after infection. Okay, very good. Thanks for that, Dr. Parekh. Jesse, let's take another call. Our next call is Rose in Georgia. Hey, Rose, welcome to our program. Go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you. Um, this is regarding the negotiations for the right now the current list of 10 drugs. And my question is, will the negotiations include the brand version of the medication as well as generic? 
Uh, Lee Purvis, let's have you answer that question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so negotiation is only going to be for drugs that have no competitors. So it will be brand name drugs that do not have a generic equivalent. So any drug that has its price negotiated will be a brand name drug. Generic drugs will not be included. Okay, Lee, thank you so much for that. And thank you also, Dr. Uh, Parekh, for um, answering all of our questions. It's been a really informative discussion. And thank you, our AARP members, volunteers, and listeners for participating in our conversation today. AARP, of course, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization, and we have been working to promote the health and well-being of older Americans for more than 60 years. All of the resources referenced today, including a recording of our Q&A event, can be found at aarp.org slash health discussion starting tomorrow, September 15th. Thank you for participating in our call and have a great day. This concludes our call.